Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today I want to break down some common misconceptions about Star Wars, and there's a lot of them, so let's begin. When in doubt in Star Wars, always listen to Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! Otherwise, limbs will be lost. You should also listen to old Ben Kenobi when it comes to stormtroopers. And these last points, only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. Now you might be thinking to yourself, that sounds like the opposite of what we know about stormtroopers. They're incompetent cannon fodder who can't see and can't aim. But that's only true if the individuals they're facing have plot armor and are named characters in one of the main films or the Rebels cartoon. If you've read any of the supporting literature in Star Wars, you'll know exactly what I mean. If you haven't, don't worry, that's why you have super nerdy Star Wars fans like me loading up videos onto YouTube to fill you in. See, the Stormtroopers are actually considered a pretty well put together unit. I wouldn't necessarily say that they were elite, but they were definitely trained for direct combat and most Stormtroopers expected to go into combat. You see, the Galactic Empire military is broken up into three branches, the Imperial Navy, Imperial Army, and the Stormtrooper Corps. The Stormtrooper Corps was a lot smaller than the other two branches of the Imperial military, and they focused more on infantry. They usually carried out operations on Imperial Navy ships and alongside Imperial Army ground assets. Imperial Navy and Imperial Army ground assets were also equipped to fight as infantry, but they were generally used as reserve units and regular units. Stormtroopers were usually found at the spearhead of any offensive action. They were used as shock troopers, just like their namesake. The original Stormtroopers were World War I infantry units, usually armed with close-range weapons and a lot of grenades. Their job was to break through enemy trench lines. In Star Wars, whenever an enemy position is too stubborn to take, or a bulkhead is too fortified to break, the Stormtrooper ultimately will have to take on that task. So Elite, perhaps not, but definitely a well-equipped and well-trained unit. Definitely better trained than your average Rebel infantry unit. Speaking of Rebel infantry, not all Rebels were idealistic, morally rock-solid farmers from the Outer Rim fighting against tyranny. The Rebel Alliance, for most of its history, was a pretty desperate military organization, if it could even be called that. In the earlier days, the Alliance to Restore the Republic was more of a loose coalition of small rebel cells. A very decentralized coalition that actually was made up of ideologically and structurally very different factions. It's kind of like now how you have groups in Africa, South Asia, and the Middle East claiming that they're a part of ISIS when in reality they're just local gangs and criminal organizations. For the Rebel Alliance, you had hardened insurgents like Saw Gerrera's partisans who ambushed Imperial convoys in densely populated areas, which oftentimes led to innocent bystanders getting killed or hurt. Then you had volunteer units like Twilight Company, which literally recruited whoever they could find from the battlefield, including gang members, deserters from the Empire, slaves, basically anyone who thought life in the Rebel Alliance would be an upgrade. And these Rebel units were usually far from heroic in their actions on the battlefield. Because we all know what happens when you arm a bunch of poorly disciplined young men with weapons and then just let them loose. Just because the Republic and the New Republic were representative democracies didn't mean they were perfect. While there might not have been as much terror and suffering directly created as a result of government policies like during the Imperial Era or the First Order Era, the Republic and the New Republic was still rife with corruption and incompetent leaders. During a period of time leading up to the Clone Wars, for instance, a general poor distribution of resources left the Outer Rim underdeveloped and lacking essential services, which was what created room for commercial entities like the Trade Federation to take over and exploit local planets. Although intention is important, the result of one's actions should also be clearly looked at. A government or a politician should not simply be given a pass because they have good intentions, because incompetency kills as indiscriminately as evil does. Another misconception that people had was that the Jedi were invincible and very hard to kill. While that might be true for the top 1% of Jedi Knights and Masters, Below this extremely skilled portion of Jedi, the skill of the individual Jedi dropped drastically. 
First and foremost, only a small percentage of the Jedi Order was actually specialized in combat. And even then, the combat-focused Jedi all had special type of skills and abilities suited for certain types of fighting. During the Battle of Geonosis, every Jedi who specialized in the sixth form of lightsaber combat died. As a matter of fact, more than 80% of the task force in the arena perished. A lot of that has to do with a Jedi's ability in combat. You see, the Jedi weren't actually able to slow down time or extra resilient to damage. Instead, they had the power of precognition, which meant that they could see attacks coming. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can avoid that attack, even if they can see it coming. It only took one misstep on the battlefield for death to come. The reason why Jedi have lightsaber forms in the first place is during combat, a truly in tune Jedi will fight almost instinctively and let the Force guide their actions rather than their mind. And the reality was, a lot of Jedi just weren't all that in tune with the Force. Which is how a normal human like Jango Fett was able to kill several Jedi with his bare hands. Another misconception of the Jedi was that they were perfect individuals, completely pious and harboring no vices. But that was far from the truth. Many Jedi drank, and I'm sure even a few partook in some more illicit drugs. There was no official Jedi code against the use of mind-altering substances as long as it didn't become a problem. Celibacy, while favored by the Jedi Council, was also not a requirement. Jedi could have casual relations as long as it didn't bear them a child or some kind of long-term commitment. A Jedi was allowed to enjoy everything that life has to offer as long as it didn't control them and stop them from performing their duties. Most people correlate good and evil with the light and dark side of the Force. But that's not really a fair description of the Force. Both the light and dark side of the Force are entities that occurred naturally in the galaxy and depend on each other to exist. Without death and decay, there can't be life. This constant struggle between the light and the dark is very natural, and it's what creates life. As a matter of fact, every individual, including you and me, have the light and dark side of the Force inside themselves. Even the most vicious Sith Lord and the most pious Jedi Master has a bit of both. So the Jedi who believe that the dark side needed to be destroyed in order to restore balance to the Force misunderstand the very nature of the Force. The Force is not sentient in the way we think of sentience, and it does not have good or evil intentions. It simply just exists. It flows through everything in the galaxy like water, and like any ocean, it's futile to try to control it. The ancient Jedi understood this, and instead of trying to keep one side of the Force away from them, they embraced both sides. They learned to tame both the dark and light side within themselves, and if any individual drifted too far to one side, they would actually be sent to a moon where they would contemplate how to return to their own balance. When the first and second Death Star were destroyed, I cringed when I saw all the Rebels and heroes of the franchise celebrating. Sure, the Death Stars were fair game because they were military target, but the sheer scale of these stations meant that millions of people were on board, and due to the abrupt nature of the explosions that took out these stations, a huge percentage of those people most likely died, including tons of non-combatants and civilian contractors. Then you also had Imperial Navy, Imperial Army, and Stormtroopers, who were what I consider good Imperials who served the Empire in pursuit of peace and stability. Many Imperials had seen the devastation caused by the Clone Wars and the lawlessness created in the vacuum of the Republic's weak security apparatus. To them, the Empire served as a bulwark against the chaos in the galaxy. Most Imperials were also blind to many of the travesties the Empire committed, especially after the Battle of Yavin when Emperor Palpatine began cracking down heavily on the rebel factions. I don't really know why so many people think Ewoks are cute. Let's not forget the first encounter between the Ewoks and the Rebels was when Han, Chewie, and Luke were captured by a hunting party brought to their tree village where they were moments away from getting cooked alive and eaten. And yes, this falls under some people's definition of cannibalism, which is eating another sentient being. Although it is hard to say how sentient the Ewoks were. But they definitely were extremely strong for their tiny size. They were able to jump from the treetops and land on the ground with little injury and could beat down a full grown man wearing armor with their little furry hands. Luckily, they weren't blaster proof and also delicious, which meant that many of them were hunted for their meat, which could control their population somewhat. Jar Jar Banks is like the Borat of Gungans. Are there Kazakhs like Borat? 
Maybe, but overall, Sasha Baron Cohen's portrayal of Borat is not representative of all Kazakhs. As a matter of fact, he's not even a Kazakh himself. Jar Jar is also an outlier when it comes to Gungans. The Gungans were actually a warrior species that were quite intelligent. Their technology, while naturalistic in its approach, was still impressive. They had built massive underwater cities and a fleet of submersibles that were capable of going down to incredible depths. Jar Jar was a clown and most likely an evil Sith who didn't really represent the average Gungan, who was far more stoic and far less annoying. Some people claim that Rey is not deserving of the power she has, especially her combat prowess. But let's not forget for the last decade, she had been working as a scavenger inside of derelict Star Destroyers, which involves a good amount of hazard and hard work. She's not exactly sitting on her ass in front of a computer the whole time. During this time, she also had to learn how to defend herself from less friendly scavengers because, let's be honest, it's not a job that attracts the best people. But then, how does Rey defeat Kylo Ren? an individual who has been trained since youth to use a lightsaber. Well, the same way a very green Luke Skywalker was able to defeat Clone Wars hero and master duelist Darth Vader. Remember what we said about lightsaber combat before? A Jedi's instincts were oftentimes faster than their mind's ability to communicate with the body. Therefore, the best fighters memorized lightsaber forms and then fell deep into the Force in almost a trance-like nature. So it's possible for someone strong in the Force but with little experience to beat a more experienced individual in a lightsaber duel. So there you have it guys, those are 10 misconceptions we oftentimes have about Star Wars, but I'm sure you guys know a lot more, so let me know in the comment section below what they are. Also, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. Thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.